Dr. Hart, Christina Bauer with the Texas Lyme Alliance. Thanks so much for joining me for an interview today with Biologics talking about phage therapy. Hey, Christina. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, I saw someone had posted the article that came out talking about your phage therapy. And so they started asking a lot of questions. I have to tell you, it is um, getting a lot of comments on our forum. People are very interested in finding yeah. out more about something that is beneficial for persistent Lyme. So can you tell me a little bit about phage therapy? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So uh, as I go into the phage therapy, let me explain what a phage is. Okay. okay. Uh, phages are viruses that live inside things like bacteria, they live inside fungus, mold, candida, parasites, they live inside other viruses. So their job is a couple of things. Number one, their job is to kind of keep the bacteria, let's say, let's use bacteriophages since we're talking about Borrelia and Lyme. So okay. bacteriophages, their job as viruses is to keep the bacteria in check, to keep the bacteria from getting too overgrown, too um, out of control in nature, okay? okay? So that's kind of like their maintenance mode to maintain. They have a second mode if things get too out of control called a lytic mode that breaks the bacteria down and kills it, okay? Their job is to keep it under control and kill it down if it's too much. So phage therapy or uh, the biologic center we call induced native phage therapy is an aqueous solution. It's a liquid solution of nanoparticle silica and nanoparticle gold in very dilute concentrations that carry a complex electromagnetic signature. And, and what that does is it induces the phages that are already inside the Borrelia to turn to that lytic phase and kill the Borrelia inside the body and even the persister cells. So it's a really neat way to access the phages that are already inside of patients. That's wonderful. Okay, and can you explain to me how you test to find out what phages to apply to individual people? Yeah, so we're using multiple phases of testing. Um, we are using blood testing. So we use red labs. They have a Felix test for bacteria phages for all different species of Borrelia. So we utilize them, especially with our research. That is the main lab we're using with the research. Uh, patients come in with other forms of testing like arm and labs or IGENIX. Uh, we can utilize that to determine. And then we can also utilize a biofeedback system of bioresonance scanning that Dr. Jernigan developed to test and figure out which phase to use. Very cool. Okay, and what all are you able to treat with phage therapy? Borrelia and what else? Yeah, so for sure we're using Borrelia. And then with the research project we're using, uh, really is the main focus of that one. Clinically though, we've seen great results using it for candida, other types of mold and fungus other uh, bacteria as well. So some of the co-infections like Bartonella, uh, Babesia even, Mycoplasma, we've been able to use the phages successfully with. Um, we've seen it used successfully also with parasites even. So if you go onto our website, biologiccenter.com, to our blog about the phages, okay. uh, if you're not uh, too squeamish, you can click a link and there's even a picture of a patient. The only thing she took was a phage directed at a parasite. And within five hours, she passed the tapeworm. And you can wow. see the tapeworm she passed. So kind of gross, but uh, it's a good, uh, a good right, uh, understanding of what happens and how quickly it can work with the phages. Okay, that's awesome. Because as you know, we are um, always looking for new and different ways to treat persistent Lyme and co-infections. And it's always really interesting to come across something like this that isn't going to tear up the stomach. Yes. Um, so that's really wonderful. Um, you mentioned your study. Can you talk a little bit about the study that you're doing and the clinical applications that you're doing and when that might be out and available to verify what y'all are saying phage therapy can do for patients? So well, the study will have a couple arms to it. Uh, the okay. initial portion, we had patients do a, a pre-test through Felix Lab. It's a, a bacteriophage PCR type test um, to scan for Borrelia. And then we treated with the correct uh, induced native phage therapy for whatever was there. And then we retested after two weeks and again uh, 45 days later. 
to make sure that those are there. So uh, what we're finding is 100% clearance there of those uh, Borrelia cells that we were finding. The next arm we'll look at then will be uh, trying to take this further to some international patients who aren't our patients. So the lab, we're working with some of the lab MD to hopefully extend that study out to even further. But the first arm consists of those retesting and then applying the phage therapy for them. Uh, the key there is we're not using any other antimicrobials. So they're not taking any prescription or even herbal antimicrobials at that point. They're just using the phage therapy. That's so cool. This is really wonderful. And um, in our previous conversation, you mentioned that this is just something your uh, biologics um, center came up with, right? This is proprietary? Correct, yeah. It's something that is innovated at the center. Dr. Jernigan uh, came up with the idea and we developed it and applied it at the clinic and that's where we ended up with our, our final product. Okay. I had heard patients on our forum talking about how phage therapy has been around a while. What is the difference between the old application of phage therapy for like a scratch or something where you break the skin open versus what y'all are doing? Yeah, so the original application of phage therapy was basically if somebody had some sort of an infection, let's say like they had, like if you're raising your scratch, let's say they had a staph infection. So what they would do is they'd have to culture that staph from that staff that they cultured, they would have to extract the bacteria phages, clean them up, and then try to grow enough of them to re-inject that those bacteria phages could then attack the staff. Okay. It is a really neat application, um, but it's a little bit slow um, and it's very difficult to do, right? Um, we would probably have it more often in America uh, if it wasn't so slow and it, it, it um, unfortunately made a better profit margin from some pharmaceutical companies. It's not, it's, it's intensive, right? So there's not a good profit yeah. margin for a lot of companies to use it. Um, so what induced native phage therapy does is we get to skip some of those steps. So we get to use the phages, we're activating them that are already present in the body. We don't have to culture them per se. We can activate them while they're still inside of the patient, inside of that host bacteria. And so instead of having to apply external phages, we are getting to um, use the ones that are already present. So it's very convenient. Okay, and that's really cool. Uh, so what you're doing is you're matching the particular strains that an individual is showing they test for with your application of the actual treatment. Is that correct? Right, yeah. Not it's a test, you're not culturing. Right, no, no, yeah, it's a test. It's almost like yeah, you're figuring out their phone number, right? And once you get their exact phone number, you can dial them up and, and tell them to go ahead, it's time to turn on the lytic phase that you, they can uh, eliminate the bacteria from inside out and reproduce as well. So they can proliferate uh, and increase the lytic activity. Very cool, sounds really interesting. I'm excited to see that study when it comes out. Please be sure to send it my way so I can share it in our forums um, on social media. I for sure will, yeah. Very cool. What is the process for the treatment? Yeah, so what we're doing um, if we're processing when patients come into the center for the phage therapy, uh, we run all the usual labs. So I want to get a broad overview to make sure we're not missing anything else. So as many Lyme patients know, it's not necessarily just the presence of the bacteria. There's other things going on, right? They might have toxic effects from living uh, in our world. They might have a poor digestive system or adrenal fatigue or um, other neurotransmitter issues, all sorts of things going on, right? So mm -hmm. we want to do some other blood tests and GRT testing. We want to make sure that we take into account all of that. From there, we'll get them prepared for the phage therapy, whatever that looks like. Supporting their digestion, supporting the gut environment, the microbiome, getting detox up and running, whatever we need to do to get that set. So after we have that set and it's time to work on the immune system, then we're using the Felix testing, we're using other lab testing, we're using the bioresin scanning to pick and determine which to treat. And then we're using that exact phage therapy for the patient. So we get the phage therapy set for them. Uh, and that's when we will administer treatment at that point. Uh, it's an oral solution. Uh, so it's, it's just like taking a dropper under the tongue. Uh, and usually okay. the dosage will last, depending on the patient, somewhere for three to 14 days, depending on how long we want to keep them on it. Um, and then from there, the rest of the treatment at the center depends on the patient 
but we may be working on very specific things with them if they've got other functional neurological issues or structural issues or uh, different biochemical processes we need to support. We'll work on those as well to support the structure and function. But that's the, that's the gist of how we get the phage up and running. Somebody's been there before uh, and or you're curious about what we did before and kind of what we continue to add on to now. So the, the traditional treatment approach we had, we are combining uh, biological medicine with energy medicine. So we're using the wisdom and nature of the body. Uh, a lot of our biological, American biological medicine, we learned from the Swiss and German medicine and then applied it um, with American functional medicine understanding. Uh, and then we're mixing that with energy medicine. Okay, so that's kind of our approach to give you a little background. So patients come, they stay with us for on average between one and three weeks. It's an all-inclusive approach. So a patient comes in with the labs and things and they meet with the doctor on day one for approximately 90 minutes. We get an idea of what's going on with them. We really wanna hear their story and tease out any details we can. We're gonna do an exam and figure out where to start. Uh, from there, from that perspective, we'll work on things like big structural issues like fascia problems, scar tissue, um, cranial fixation problems, things like that. We'll get all that cleaned up. And we'll do some gentle but kind of chiropractic type spinal work, a very gentle base um, to make sure we've got that opened up. Then we're looking at their different, the priorities of the body. So very often a patient needs some gentle detoxification support, uh, what naturopaths call getting the uh, emunctories up and moving. So getting that, the body draining, right? Well, we looked at different things like methylation, digestion, hormones, neurotransmitter balance, uh, mitochondrial support, whatever that patient needed, we would look at. Now, to dive into some of the um, energy medicine side of things, bioresonance scanning is a frequency-based testing system and then applied frequency-based treatments. So for instance, we use a lot of herbal, anthroposophical, homeopathic supplements in the clinic, nutraceuticals. So we frequency match that to the patient. So whatever the particular issue is, let's say we're dealing with leaky gut. Okay. Well, I, I don't necessarily just say, let's get you on some collagen, right? I mean, that's great for leaky gut. But what I want to do is I want to precisely match what's going on with that patient to the correct remedy. So sometimes it might be collagen or colostrum or L-glutamine, but sometimes what that patient really needs is maybe a particular herbal blend and let's say some zinc to heal that gut. But I wouldn't have got there without being able to precisely match that to the patient. So the energy medicine really comes in. It helps us to figure out exactly what frequencies are going on in the body and then match that to the inverse correction. So in the clinic, we actually keep in every doctor's room, there's over 4,000 different remedies. Okay, we have everything from supplements and the, the basics like that to Chinese herbs and American herbs. We have essential oils, anthroposophical remedies. Whatever we think that we find can help a patient, we put on that shelf to be able to precisely match to them. So from there, we use that energetic medicine and then including a lot of light-based therapies, sound frequency-based therapies. We use scalar technology quite a bit in the clinic uh, to develop that. And that would be kind of consistent with uh, the traditional approach without phages, right? And so for supporting the immune system, uh, dealing with things like Borrelia or Bartonella or parasites, we would frequency match to different immune supporting remedies. Like um, we might use some uh, different nutraceuticals like any, maybe some biopure type stuff, Japanese knotweed, andrographis, lion's mane, things that support the system, right? Uh, yeah. And other frequency-based remedies. So now a lot of times in lieu of that, we get to utilize the phage therapy, okay? And especially in the study, to keep it really clean, we didn't use any antimicrobial or immune modulating uh, herbs. Okay. Um, uh, if a patient's not in the clinical study, which that first arm we're basically complete with, if they're not in that clinical study now, if it makes sense to give them something that balances the immune system, like if they've got some autoimmune tendencies, we might use different like cordyceps and things to balance the immune system, et cetera. Now, um, but instead often we'll, we'll target very specifically with the phage therapy to support for them. And so what that looks like for us is instead of taking a longer time to clear that Borrelia signal or whatever, uh, we're seeing it as quickly as three days. Oh, wow. And so that's happening very fast with the phage work. It's, it's moving very rapidly for us. And so patients oftentimes now will, uh, like for instance, I had a case where we did a phone consult just recently. We did 
um, phage therapy for Babesia. Uh -huh. and, and particularly, I was thinking her foot pain was related to Babesia. Within the first couple of doses of the phage therapy, her foot pain was gone. Uh, it was eliminated and has not returned. So it's, it's very fast acting um, and we're seeing rapid results with it. That was my next question you've touched a little bit on. What's the recovery look like for people? Yeah, so the results we're seeing often are within three to 14 days, very quick turnaround results, sometimes instantly, uh, very quickly after the first dose, patients are starting to notice some things shift. Most patients, I would say well over 90%, uh, have either um, a favorable outcome very quickly, but no negative side effects, or it's neutral to favorable with no negative side effects. A few patients are uh, experiencing some uh, cytokine, you know, inflammatory response, maybe a little bit of a, a small Herxheimer type inflammatory response, but it's minimal and very easily adjusted. Uh, we're finding instead of taking a little more time, like with the antimicrobial or immune stimulating herbs, sometimes it takes a little time. Many patients will notice to clean that Herxheimer reaction up. This is very quick because uh, the uh, phages themselves are actually immune modulating. So they do actually balance cytokines and inflammation out themselves too. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Um, yeah, very gentle. Yeah, that's, um, we come across so many patients in the forums and I'm talking about um, other Facebook forums, not just our uh, Disulfram Experience Forum, but across um, Lyme patients forums uh, for different doctors and so forth, but uh, so many people are super, super sensitive and a lot of them are coming across with fungus, candida, mold. Yes. Uh, so it, those types of things in a, a Lyme patient, using Lyme as the umbrella term for a tick-borne illness, Lyme and co-infections, very typical that uh, Lyme patients have mold issues very typical. So you're using this for mold, candida, Lyme co-infections. Is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you're using it for that you've had success with? Uh, we've had some success kind of bridging some of the, the virophage world uh, into that. Oh, good. Yeah, so yeah, we're you mentioned that. that gap. Yeah, and so that's that's been really interesting with some, some neat results with some Epstein-Barr cases and things like that. Um, yeah, so to touch even on the sensitive patients, for instance, uh, it's always nice to hear some patient stories, I think, for people to relate. Yeah. So if you uh, currently have a, a MCAS patient, right, a mast cell activation. Uh, she's on very few foods, very few supplements, because otherwise she reacts. She does very well with the phage therapy. She's able to take it orally uh, and does very well with that. So it, it makes it very easy because I don't have to add a lot of other things that might activate those mast cells, right? So we're able to use that to help get after her parasites and her mold. Uh, the two big things she's dealing with that seem to be activating her mast cells. Um, and a lot of patients who just can't seem, um, it's almost, you know, for some patients, mold is almost like a curse, right? Oh, it's horrible. We've remediated six times in our house. Exactly. It's like it follows you. Oh. And so uh, for those cases, I've had a lot of success using the mold phage, uh, especially if they get re-exposed. They can just restart the mold phage, uh, depending on the particular type they have. Uh, we can use the different uh, phages we have for it. Again, I'm starting, and it's, and it's really helpful so that they don't go into that, you know, chronic inflammatory state, right? That's a sear that's so associated with mold. You can really help keep that from a massive fallback. So it's, it's been fantastic for those patients as well. Very cool. Um, you mentioned if people do get a Herx from phage therapy, what do you use with treating those herxes with cytokine or whatever it might be, die off um, frequency medicine, I assume? Or yeah. are you applying things like Alka-Seltzer Gold or sauna? Yeah, so if they're in the clinic, uh, one of the things they're typically doing is a lot of like lymphatic type drainage work, the sauna to increase detoxification, of course. But often I will make sure I apply a toxin binder of some sort. Um, and that's very dependent on the patient. Um, and so just to clean up the mess a little bit, uh, at times I will use a lot of, in the, in the room, I'll use versions of energy medicine if they're on my table. So when they're there, they see me or they see one of the other doctors every day, right? So if you take the phages, let's say today's Thursday, you took a dose today, tomorrow you come in to see me on Friday and you say, 
doc, I've, I've, I'm flaring up. I've got these extra symptoms. I've got, I feel like I've got the flu. I feel terrible. Okay, let's get you on the table. Let's figure out what's going on. A lot of times, even without applying an external substance, just using the treatment in the room, the bioresonance scanning, the frequency medicine, the energetic medicine, I think we'll get that really toned down. And then from there, if we need to add um, maybe a specific herbal remedy to help tone down the cytokines or an anthroposophical remedy, we can do that. And then we can just do some good like functional medicine, right? Maybe they do well with um, curcumin or other anti-inflammatories or more like with cordyceps or a reishi yeah. to calm that down. So, but a lot of times it's very easy to calm it down in the room. Yeah, that's really great. And I like that you guys are using a lot of energy medicine. I know uh, some people don't believe in that, but it has really helped my family. We have, as you well know, but we have four congenital Lyme kudos who got it from me. Yeah. And they weren't diagnosed until our oldest was eight or nine. So oh, yeah. um, because I didn't get diagnosed for a long time after I had had it. So um we have, because of how I grew up, right, treating with a lot of colonoscopies and blood draws and nobody could figure anything out. So you're getting right. and prodded all the time. I love that there are other uh, medicine um, treatments that are effective in general. Yes. Oh, yes. You know, the, the general uh, goal is always to start from least invasive, right, and see what we can do to build up before we have to do the poke and prod route yes and so it's it's uh it is a lovely way to do it. i highly recommend if somebody is skeptical uh james oshman has a wonderful textbook on it called energy medicine the scientific basis uh okay. with references studies it's a it's a great reference book on energy medicine and i just looked up and saw this book that you were so kind to send to me a year or yeah. so ago um, not that we're here selling books, but this explains a lot of the stuff you're talking about today, except yeah. for the phage therapy, but the energy medicine, how it works, and what Dr. Jernigan's approach was, and that's called Beating Lyme Disease from Dr. David Jernigan. Um, one more thing I wanted to ask that patients will be very interested in while we're on this topic is age range. Since I mentioned I have congenital kids, we're always looking for different things that are um, effective, of course, but that are not going to traumatize a kiddo. What's the yeah. ages that you're seeing this therapy do well with? Yes, the youngest I've used the phase therapy with is three, um, a three-year-old. Oh, wow. And then I've yeah. used some ages in between, of course, and then uh, up until, you know, 80s patient age range come in so I've used it with all the age range uh, it's a it's a great especially those extremes right because they're going to be more sensitive uh, and so that you know the person in the 80s can't really tolerate a big Herxheimer reaction or a big right. fallout right so that's yeah. great for them and then little kiddos where you're not going to get an herb or even a pill down their throat sometimes uh, a small phase therapy there's not a there's there's a taste to it but it's not terrible at all and so um, the kiddos do really well with it and obviously most kids, if the treatment's spot on, they're rapid responders, right? If it's the right treatment, they're rapid responders. So they do so well with it. So this one particular kiddo, she was uh, vaccine injured, uh, eczema case. Um, and so she had some uh, mold issues as well, mold exposure in her home. And so we used it for mold and some parasite work. Uh, and right, parasite works a lot of times a long drawn out process of herbals and things like that, maybe some anti-parasitic medications. And we resolved it very quickly for her utilizing the phase therapy. Easy, no fuss. She just had a couple of funny bowel movements passing the parasites and that was it. So that's amazing. And are they seeing the same successes as far as testing them 45 days out like you were mentioning in your study? Right. Continuing to be um, Borrelia free. Yeah. That's fantastic. Okay. And um I wanted to mention, because I usually always mention this first off, is uh, this is not medical advice for people who are listening. This is for informational purposes. If you have questions, please ask your doctor. Call uh, Dr. Hart at biologiccenter.com and ask any questions you have. Um, but uh, also, I wanted to ask, since I mentioned that 
what's your favorite binder? That's always everybody's question to me as I've done so many interviews with doctors who use different things. Yes. Um, I know what works for me is, you know, maybe different from some of your other patients. What do you use traditionally that you see working really well? Yeah. So um, I would say the one that I'm finding that tests most often and is uh, gentle and I like it all as a broad binder is extracts of humic and folic acid. Okay. Uh, so um, Dr. Todd Watts has found a great blend of uh, humic and folic acid. It's, it's a great applicable binder, very gentle. You can take it with food and supplements. So that one is very often a good one I use. Um, if I'm getting into more of like heavy metal work, I'll use IMD mixed with some of that, the uh, functionalized silica. Uh, I'll use some of that. Um, and then occasionally I will use some carbonized bamboo. Oh, wow. Yeah. So carbonized. Really yeah. Carbonized makes sense. Bamboo. Okay. Yeah. And then we'll use a smattering. You know, we keep all the major binders, charcoal, um, chlorella, things like that, clay. We've got all that to taste patients on, and those all kind of mix in and out depending on what they're going on. But those are the ones I most commonly use. Yeah. Very cool. Thanks for giving patients some tips they can talk to their doctor about. Okay, what does the process look like when somebody comes into uh, your facility for maybe a week or two? What what's what is the first thing that y'all do? Yeah. So as soon as they come in, uh, they're greeted by our wonderful staff. Um, and so the staff then will get them checked in. Uh, once they're checked in, we will give them a tour of the clinic so they know where the restrooms are at or the cafes at and where to wait for the doctor visits. Uh, and then once they're settled, we start a process of what's called computer regula regulated thermography. It's a whole okay. body scan for us to get, figure out what's going on. Um, once they've done that, then they will wait for their doctor appointment. So that day one, it is a 90 minute uh, sit down with the doctor where we go over your paperwork, we go over really your story. So coming from being trained in homeopathy, being trained in Chinese and biological medicine, we really want to tease out any details we can that will help drive uh, your treatment approach, All right? So we want to, want to get to know you. We want to get to know your story, what you've been through. And then we'll do an exam. We'll do a good physical exam. We'll do a bioresonance scanning exam and we'll get you started on some therapies. So on average, patients are in the clinic four to six hours a day doing some therapies. Uh, so they might do things like sauna, neurofeedback, uh, lymphatic massage, lymphatic drainage. We have frequency-based light and sound therapies. And so then as you're going through those one, two, three weeks, we're working you through a progression of based on your case and what we want to help solve so we can optimize your structure and function and help you get your life back. Very cool. That's always my goal in helping patients is to get moms back in the kitchen and dads yes. back in the community working and um, getting people out of bed is how exactly. I put it. Yeah. Um, that's so typical with Lyme patients is the main uh, complaint is usually fatigue. Yes. Uh, so muscle weakness, um, that kind of thing. So uh, get out of bed. That's always our goal. Yes when we help Lyme patients. Okay, and then um, let's see. Oh, how does the phage therapy get into tissues and cross the blood-brain barrier? Yeah, so the really neat part about getting deep into the tissues, crossing the blood-brain barrier, is the nanoparticle solution it's in. Okay, so it's nanoparticle silica and nanoparticle gold. So that can cross all those barriers. It gets very deep. It's a very good carrier for that. You can almost think of it like a great way to work with the body software uh, and hardware of the body. If you're using computer metaphor, that silica and that gold. And so it does a really great job of carrying that electromagnetic signal into those areas. Very cool. Okay. And then um, after the treatment, have patients tested with Igenix or Galaxy Labs other than the Felix? Now, we haven't had a lot of patients do that yet. Uh, okay. That will not be part of the study, but uh, clinically, we are having some patients do some pre and post tests to see how it goes. Now, some of those that are doing antibody tests, you have to wait for the antibodies to clear, right? They okay. have to uh, calm down. So what we are seeing, though, is uh, on the handful of cases that I do have some of those pre and post tests, 
um, the antibodies go down very, very quickly. Uh, so whereas they might have been very high initially, and um, if you test too quickly, they might still be present. Okay. But for instance, one case was down by three quarters. The antibodies uh, were down by three quarters one week after finishing the uh, treatment. So it's, it's, it can be very rapid. But we'll get more data on that as we go along for patient's yeah. sake. But uh, the key to remember is it takes a little time for the body to clear those antibodies. Yeah, definitely. Uh, do you have any data with what the typical time is for a patient to clear antibodies? I know this is a new treatment for you guys, but have you tracked any of that yet? Yeah, I mean, you can see antibody clearing somewhere. Now with the phase therapy, I haven't tracked it enough to give you good data. But right. in general, on patients starting to clear Lyme overall, you can see some improvement within, you know, six to six weeks to three months time. You'll see those antibodies clearing out and going down. That's so cool. And what is the cost of the treatment? Typically run a patient for a week. Yeah, the cost, I'm not going to be exactly accurate. It's, it's That's you know, okay. in, yeah, in the 5,000 mark or so, um, our patient care coordinators would kind of be really be the ones to to knock that question out for me, but yeah. um, that does include, so it's an all-inclusive package, right? So that okay. includes seeing the doctor every day. That includes okay. your four to six hours of therapies. And uh, really important, it includes any supplements, any remedies, any of the phage therapy we give you while you're in the clinic. Okay. Uh, anything we recommend like that, it's included in that cost. Okay. So often it ends up being a money saver in the long run for those patients. So we're really getting them over the big, uh, as any Lyme patient knows, you're really slugging away at this stuff for a long time, a lot of times, right? And so by having that intensive treatment that's tailored to you, so it goes as slow as we need to, but it is, it is a, a concentrated treatment. It allows them to get over a lot of stuff quickly. And mm -hmm. so it can really be a money saver in the long run. I had a friend that just crossed my mind. Maybe you can or can't answer this. Uh, I had a friend that went to see you a few years ago, and she said that somehow you were able to test the blood flow going to her brain right yes you can do that yeah so we can we can utilize a combination of the bioresonance scanning and the computer regulated thermography to get a very good oh, idea thermography, of course okay yeah, to regulate blood flow going to the brain uh, and there's the different regions can help us gauge you know some uh, look at the carotid internal carotids and the jugulars uh, and so we get a really good idea of what's going on in there that's so cool. Um, yeah, that's really helpful because, as you know, um, there's so much um, brilliant that love the neck area. There's a lot oh, yes. of car um, uh, bones in the neck and um, the arteries uh, love to hang out. Um, okay, so this is a key question for you. Maybe you can answer it for me is, have you treated COVID yet? Okay. So um, let me give you my technical spiel. Okay. We don't um, treat any name disease, right? We just support the structure and function of the body to optimize when patients are dealing with those things. Okay. So I had some patients who, uh, when they were home, uh, they did come down with COVID. Uh, and I have seen good results supporting their body with a combination of herbal and they happen to be on phage therapies and do very, very well with it. Okay, oh, wow. so I don't want to say that we treated COVID by any means, but yeah. those patients have done very, very well. That's so cool. That's so cool. Very good to hear. As you know, there's so many things out there that um, people are hearing that can and uh, do treat COVID, but I, there's nothing conclusive. So, um, yes. okay. Um, on your website now, and I'm looking at why I NPT over other therapies. And the next question that I have interest in is, is this designed to penetrate bacterial uh, biofilms? Can you talk a little bit more about how these pathogens hide in biofilm and parasites, for instance, yeah. and how the phage treatment might be able to get into those and bust and yeah the way i like to think of biofilms is almost like um you know you see especially um communities that are estranged or even homeless communities what do they do is they band together right they're all these these kind of estranged folks and they band together and they take in anything they can from their surroundings 
and kind of make a community out of it, right? They might build homes or walls out of tents and shopping carts and pieces of cardboard and sheet metal, right? But they, they, they end up making a home, a community. Biofilms are essentially that, right? The bacteria, the fungi, the candida, they, they form together a unit. They pull what they can. They pull heavy metals. They pull mucus. They, they knit together the fiber and factors. And so they make this essential home almost that protects them from the environment around them, protects them from the immune system, um, can make them uh, up to a thousand times uh, resistant, more resistant to uh, antibiotics and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's uh, really great for them, but not so great for us, right? So you can do biofilm busting, of course, and that's, that's a great methodology, but it also has its drawbacks. The nice thing about phages we're seeing is that with the nanoparticle concentrations, it seems to be able to basically seep its way into the biofilm, okay? And then it, it, it basically destroys that bacteria that's in the biofilm from the inside out. So it does a really great job of that. Now, by that same token, um, a parasite can be infected with anything you're infected with, okay? Yeah. If, if you, it can catch anything you've got. Uh, and so you want to make sure that if you've got parasites, if you have parasites, you're dealing with those. And the phage therapy, we can do that twofold. We can utilize the phage therapy to deal with the virus, excuse me, to deal with the parasites. And then we can utilize the phage therapy to deal with the bacteria the parasites have, okay, that they're harboring. And so that phage therapy will penetrate both, right? So we'll usually use it as a one-two combination if, we're, if we think you have parasites, if we find that. And so we'll utilize the phages for parasites. And then that phage therapy, for instance, for Borrelia, can penetrate the phage, can penetrate the parasites to deal with that Borrelia. That's so interesting. I just remembered off the top of my head two more questions that a patient had asked um, if this is something sublingual, would you not just excrete this out in your next bowel movement? How does that work? Yeah, sure. So that uh, was a great question. <laughs> it is a great question. So number one, it is a rapid absorption. Okay, it's a very quick absorption. And we do have patients hold it uh, sublingually for a little while to get that submucosal capillary bed absorption. Okay, that's very solvent under your tongue. Um, even if you're going to do like an herbal, let's say, research has shown it very quickly gets in those capillary beds. Uh, if you need something to get into the brain, it's a great way to hold it under the tongue a little longer, okay, because it gets those capillary beds. So there's that, and that is partially the way we're recommending it, but it's a rapid absorption. So the second, okay. it, the second it hits any of your membranes, even topically, it's beginning to work and beginning to be absorbed. Uh, and that's all we really need because of that nanoparticle solution carrying the electromagnetic signal. All we need is the start and then it's already triggering that process. And isn't that how you typically apply this treatment for sensitive patients is topically? Did you mention that before to me? Yeah, we can use it topically for certain sensitive cases. I did that for a couple of patients today uh, and it does work very well. Um, ideally, we would get it in a patient sublingually just to get the, you know, hedge all of our bets and get everything on our side. But it, it do, all it needs to be is on a membrane for the patient. So um, under the tongue, on the skin, uh, but mostly we try to do it sublingually. And how many patients have you had come through Biologic Center so far that have had phage therapy? Yeah, we've used it. Uh, we started really working with it in November. So we've been using it with patients uh, since then. Uh, and so... Uh, we could probably say we've, we've done it with oh, maybe dozens, if not up to 100 patients uh, or more. Uh, I'm trying okay. to do a little math here in my head about how many patients we would see. So if I see um, six, 24, if I see on average 24 patients a month, you know, you can kind of extrapolate the math out from there. So uh, let's say December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July. August, so we're at, what's that? Well, let's say 10 months if we're about so, this September. Yeah. So maybe closer to, we might, I, my numbers are way low. So we have to be closer to 500 plus patients. That's at least 240. <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's uh, two other doctors working with me there. Oh, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, and how many are a part of your, your clinical study that you're running right now? How many of the patients? Yeah. Yeah, so the first leg, dealt with, because uh, we started with patients who have previously tested positive, okay. and so we probably started with somewhere around 30 to 60 patients. Um, I don't know all the 
Dr. Jernigan is doing a lot of the study writing, so how many are meeting all the full criteria, but that's about the number we use. Okay, that's really cool. Um, and then, um, will the phage always be present in the body if there is any Borrelia present? Can or does Borrelia exist without its phage? Right, yeah. So, um, based on the best research, the phage cannot exist without its host bacteria. Okay, so Borrelia phage can't exist without Borrelia. So, once Borrelia is gone, the phage dies off in your body. It's done its job and it's time for it to pass on. And vice versa, the Borrelia can't exist without a phage living in it. They don't, they always go in tandem. Okay. Okay. So, um, the one thing I noticed on your website I wanted to ask you about, I, it, it really resonated with me when I read it. And it's the very first sentence on biologiccenter.com under the phage therapy link. Mm -hmm. um, and it says, did you know that your immune system should not be made solely responsible for killing the infections in your body? And I, I agree with this 100% is that Lyme patients tend to focus on kill, 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 kill. And I find after treating eight years myself and four children for six years, that there's a lot of work that needs to happen first yes in making sure that methylation is capable of right. handling additional pathogens and die off um that we're researching how we're going to address situations if things go wrong what would you say if somebody comes on your website and reads this about the immune system not being made solely responsible for killing the infections in your in their body, uh, the application of phage therapy. Um, what would you say to them when they read something like this? It sounds completely opposite of what we think we should be doing: kill, kill, kill. Yeah. With a Lyme patient with multiple so infections. Oh yeah. So there's. Um, let me give you something I call the three Ps. Okay. okay. When a patient says, what causes? Why, why, why? Right. I, I talk about what I call the three P's. Okay. There's things that predispose you to, let's just say Lyme disease. Okay. They predispose you to Lyme disease. And then there's things that precipitate or trigger the Lyme disease. And then there's things that perpetuate the Lyme disease. Okay. That's smart. Yeah. And so uh, predisposition, you know, it could be genetics. Like you talk about methylation for sure. Uh, it could be, you know, congenital right? that could predispose you. To yeah. the line. Um, you know, and then we could talk about all the other stuff, toxicity in our environment, uh, the standard American diet, all that stuff could predispose us, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, getting a tick bite could be the thing that triggers it. The Lyme bacteria got injected in your body by a tick, okay? And your immune system couldn't deal with it and you ended up with Lyme disease. So that triggers it. And then lastly, you know, that Lyme disease may eat your collagen. It could destroy some of your joints. It's leaving you with like uh, ammonia, Yes, exactly what we talked about, right? It loves the neck. It loves many of my patients ended up with uh, upper cervical instability, okay? And so uh, it could do that damage. It could cause um, astrocyte swelling in the brain, leaky brain syndrome, uh, cause all that encephalitis type damage. All of that has to be cleaned up. It doesn't just go away when the bacteria goes away. Yeah. Okay, and so um, the immune system and even doing something like phage therapy, or an antibiotic or an antimicrobial herbal protocol, no matter what you do to address the bacteria, you have to address the predisposing and the perpetuating factors as well. So you, gotta, you have to basically clean up what caused it and clean up the mess that it made as well to help them get fully well. So yes, getting rid of the bacteria goes a long way with many patients, yeah. but to get to that full wellness, that full functional wellness, uh, get them out of bed sometimes, it takes working on the other things too. So uh, definitely it's something we address for sure with our approach, like we explained, using the biological medicine, American biological medicine approach. It's a, it's a whole person, a whole being approach. So whatever's going on, you know, that many patients say, can you do this? Can you do this? Whatever shows up on my table, that's what I'm going to deal with, right? So whatever you show up with, that's what I'm going to deal with. Not just your Borrelia, not just your parasites, not just your mold, but the whole picture. And that's how we're going to help you find that wellness. That's a great answer. It's really important when Lyme patients go to choose a practitioner or physician that they 
take into consideration, um, first off, everyone is different, yeah. but treating a Lyme patient holistically rather than compartmentalizing my arm hurts, but yeah. it's connected to everything else and can be affected by everything else that's going on. So I think that's really important that people take into consideration that this is a multi-systemic disease and it has to be addressed from supporting what's there first and how to open the ways up that it's going to uh, come out, so to speak, or uh, yeah. the die-off is going to be able to be passed in a healthy way that's not going to have adverse effects. That's my next question um, from your website here. It says that phage therapy has no known adverse effects. We talked a little bit about Herxheimer reactions. No one has had any long-term adverse effects from this type of treatment? No, no known side effects, no uh, adverse effects as you might uh, like uh, find with some other things. Uh, it's been really wonderful. And like even we said with sensitive patients, things like that, it's, it's, uh, been a, a real blessing um, for us to help patients with because it has been something that I don't have to really stress on, right? I, I don't have to really stress about, is this going to be okay with so-and-so patient? Um, and even if, let's say, you accidentally took the wrong phage, for instance, phage activator, the wrong phage therapy, uh, if you don't need it, there's no phages for you. Like the, if that bacteria doesn't exist within you, there's no phages in there to activate. So it's just mute, right? It's just, it's just done. So it's, it's been really wonderful for us. And uh, I want to go back to your other point for a second. You know, you said there's an order to things. The, you know, we talked about homeschool, right? And you talk about teaching the kids maybe algebra and things like that. And you learn order of operations, right? The body has an order of operations. And so it's really important with whatever clinician you find to help you, that they understand that body's order of operations. And so that they can deal with that. They can go in that order of operations for you. And it's different for each person. So, yeah. That's a really good point. That's a good point to make because um, I've heard from several patients that work with very popular doctors across the United States who make a point to say timing is everything. Yes. So how do you apply that theory? Timing is everything when you are talking about order and process in treating someone with multi-systemic diseases? Yeah, so, uh, well, the body, bodies are a wonderfully woven tapestry, right? So if you make one change somewhere, it's gonna be felt everywhere, right? So when you're making that push and pull in the body, you have to be sure that that push and pull is, is capable of tolerating that, that new stressor, right? So as I'm, as I'm uh, examining that patient on day one, getting to know them, figuring out what's going on in their body, examining all the labs we did and the testing we've done and the bioresonance scanning and the biofeedback. I'm getting an idea of what that body needs first to address what's going on. So maybe um, dealing with the bacteria on day one is not what your body wants. Your yeah. body says, listen, I've got all this sludge accumulated in my gallbladder. If you try to stimulate everything else going on, and you try to, let's say there's probably bacteria in that, in that sludge, you start messing with that, it's gonna back up my detox even more. So let's open that up first. So I'm, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that first. And that's the beauty of having a multi-day approach, right? Having that one to three weeks, I've got the time to take that order, oper order of operations with the patient. So I can address, if we're sticking with that, that gallbladder issue, for instance, that uh, congested gallbladder before I deal with the immune dysfunction. You know, even if, even if Lyme disease is your diagnosis, let's say, um, it may not be the number one thing your body wants to work on. Your body knows and it's going to tell me. And so we're going to work with what the body tells me on how to deal with that. Yeah, that's really important. Uh, do y'all offer colonics or things like that that can help somebody who has a sludgy gallbladder? Yeah, we're a big fan of colonics, open system colonics at the clinic here. Um, we do have a setup, but COVID kind of put a kink in our colon hydrotherapist. So eventually we will have colonics at the clinic, but we are big fans of them there. Yeah, <laughs> uh, sure. Of course, nobody enjoys them, but no, they it's, do the job. Yes. it's better than doing them at home. I have to say, uh, that's not my favorite thing to do. And I'm as at home is not, um, uh, yeah, that's pretty it, universal. Patients would much prefer going to clinic one and done instead of all the mess at home. Yeah. Way easier. 
Um, okay, so that brings me to my next question is, do you all do any IVs in-house? Yes, yeah, so we do have an IV clinic that's affiliated with Biologics. Okay. Uh, that's, in, that's in our clinic building with us. Uh, and so we do offer the IVs, nutraceutical IVs, glutathione, NAD+, things like that that we're using and uh, custom recommending for the patient. Very good. Okay, great. Um, and then is any of this covered by insurance? I know that's a crazy question because everybody is um, got different coverage and insurance companies are wonky to work with one from the next and yes. uh, what they're willing to cover. But do you all have anything that you've seen patients are able to get reimbursement for? I'm sure you all don't work with insurance companies up front, but after the fact, are patients getting reimbursed for any of this stuff like IVs? Yeah, some patients, uh, their insurance companies will reimburse afterwards if they submit it themselves. Um, I have seen that. I've, many patients realize, you know, insurance companies don't love to work with um, very many clinics in this world, right? It's it's tough game back and forth, a lot of arguing, a lot of discussion. So we've, we've opted out of that. Yeah. But um, uh, for both the patient's benefit and for smooth running out of the clinic. But we've had patient success with um, submitting it themselves. We have patients do well, especially some of the more co-ops, you know, the, um, a lot of the co-ops that have formed now, the Christian co-ops, things like that, those often do reimburse uh, a good portion of that. Uh, and then different tax write-off purchases, I've seen patients do that very well with healthcare expenses. Uh, so that's what I've seen patients be successful with with that front. Okay, cool, that's good to know. I wanted to point out on your website, it says that you require everyone to do a minimum of two weeks. Is that what you're typically seeing still, or can somebody come for just one week? Yeah, we're starting to accept more one-week cases, okay. um, especially uh, if, if someone's uh, willing to submit their paperwork and just have it glanced over to make sure they're a good candidate for a one week. Uh, for a long time, we were seeing where it really was taking us two weeks to get through a lot of work and get a patient on a decent scale. Phage therapy has sped that up a lot for us. So now we're opening up to more one week patients and in severe cases, we might uh, request three weeks. Okay, good to know. Can you talk a little bit about the phages that are dominant species in the body? How many are actually human versus microbes? People don't really realize, I think what I've just read on your website, it's a little astounding. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, you're referring to some of the facts about the phages and the microbes. So, uh, you know, there's, there's trillions of human cells, and then we could uh, outnumber that somewhere between, you know, two to three to 10 to one, right? Bacteria, microbe cells to our own cells. And then on top of that, that gets uh, exponentially increased to phages to bacteria. So if you were to make phages the size of, I believe the statistic is the size of um, ladybugs, it would more than cover and put many, many layers deep the surface of the earth uh, in the world. And so phages, bacteriophages, microbiophages are super proliferative. So they're already present inside of us in massive number. So the idea that these are like, even that the, a few drops of the remedy is, it's so small, it, it doesn't matter because the phages are so exponentially huge, universally huge inside of just even our body. That's all you need to get this ball rolling to get the activation of the phases to get the outcomes we're seeing. That's so cool. Uh, they actually give a statistic um, on your website. It says only 43% of your body is human cells. The remaining 57% are microbes. And then as you mentioned, it exponentially goes up from there when you're talking about phages in your body than the actual bacteria. It's so interesting. I never thought of that, but duh, right? Yeah. Yes, I often uh, will tell patients, we're basically like a really great swamp or a really great garden. We're very much an ecological system that's, you know, we think of, it's me and I got to kill all the germs, uh, but it's not like that. We're a very big mix, a very big soup of, of bacteria and viruses and things like that that keeps us up and running. We want to be that way, right? We yeah. want, want all that stuff. It does so many great functions for our immune system and our brain and our digestion that uh, it's, we want to support them in and love on them a little bit. So eat that good diet. Yeah, that brings me to my next question. Does phage therapy infect human cells or cause human illness? That might be a fear of some people thinking they already have these strains of something or another, and then you're applying more 
of that strain. Can you explain a little bit how that works to not infect? Yes, the human they, and are, um, they are host specific. So if the okay. phage is going to uh, infect something, it's only going to affect its host specific cell. Okay? okay, so if it's an E, so let me use E. coli as an example uh, to tag on your COVID question earlier. So E. coli phages will only attack and infect E. coli. They will, okay. no phage will uh, infect a human cell. But you can use, like researchers are using E. coli phages to help prevent COVID from adhering to the uh, lung cell walls, the lung tissue wall. So uh, you can use phages to do more than just attack the bacteria. So when I said they're immune modulating, they actually help prevent some of that cytokine cascade They help down-regulate the cytokines they're getting produced. So it's a really beautiful way for somebody who's afraid of a Herxheimer reaction to deal with their microbe issue because it's, it's uh, so immune balancing. Yeah, that's really important because I have discovered there are so many misconceptions about taking probiotics and which probiotics um, patients um, uh, doing different types of diets. I'll refrain from mentioning their names, but um, that are about uh, making fermented vegetables and kombucha and that kind of thing. But what people in apple cider vinegar, those kinds of diets are very beneficial for people who don't have candida. But yeah. what you just hit on is cytokine. What about people who do already have an overgrowth of candida albicans or something like that? Uh, how can they avoid making that worse? By, by, but you mean making it worse while trying to feed the microbiome? Exactly. Yeah. So you can be very strategic with your target. So what I'll do for some patients, utilizing the biofeedback, the bioresonance scanning, okay. I will try to target uh, the precise food that will help them. So for instance, a couple of weeks ago, I figured out that this to help feed this particular bacteria that we wanted to utilize its phage to help deal with these parasites. The patient needed to eat more peas, but she has a chronic yeast problem um, that we were treating at the, we were supporting the body and dealing with at the time with uh, phages for the candida, but I didn't want to feed it while we're dealing with that, right? right. Um, so the, the peas would not activate the candida we found. So it's helpful to be very strategic like that and feed it. I, I often recommend if a patient's histamine intolerant, mast cell, they've got candida, to avoid fermented foods and things like that. Uh, and even sometimes um, some of the different types of fibrous foods that are going to really irritate those and, and try to find slowly. So like even carrots end up being a really great way that doesn't seem to stimulate too much of their stuff to feed that good bacteria. So uh, in our clinic, we'll utilize the bioresonance scanning to determine that with you. But you can go with okay. some of the less starchy, uh, but still great prebiotic type foods, but go slow and just avoid the fermented things. That's so cool. Yeah, so um, to kind of tie it all in together, I think the idea is that it's not just phage therapy, it's encompassing in a whole approach like we discussed, mm -hmm. but what we're finding with the phage therapy is it's gentle. It's so much simpler than usual protocols. Um, it's great for sensitive patients. So it ties all those aspects in very, very quickly and very succinctly. Uh, and so, and if you haven't dealt with uh, and I've heard of phages before. The best part is that it's it's something that's already present. We're getting we're not having to add a lot to the body or or come up with something. It's we're uh, it's an innovative approach to using something that's already there. And so the uh, last aspect of the clinic is the great part about Dr. Jernigan, the Biologic Center, is how innovative we constantly are. Um, we utilize the term advanced alternative medicine because it is. We're constantly innovating. We're constantly looking. Um, just like you said, to get patients out of bed and back to life. And that's what we want for every single one of our patients. Uh, and so we are always looking to improve our outcomes, improve what we're doing, improve what's happening so we can get that. And that's, I think that's what you want out of any clinician. Um, but we, we do our best to really walk that talk. That's so cool. And have you seen with maybe your first few patients where they've needed to come back for another round or... Has there been any uh, report of relapse or symptom symptoms coming back at all? Yeah, so uh, early on when I was applying it, I would only apply, because um, we didn't know how the body would respond yet to multiple phages at the same time, right? Okay. So if I was only one of the, like mycoplasma was maybe your big, big issue. I would okay. uh, start with the mycoplasma phage, 
but I knew you had other bacteria to deal with, for instance. So uh, early on those cases, I've had to subsequently, subsequently deal with those other phages. So I've had to add in the Borrelia phage or the Bartonella phage or whatnot and add that in. Um, so moving forward, that hasn't been much of an issue um, as far as like dealing with the microbes again, right? So, uh, but a patient might need to come in and we have to finish cleaning up the gut after the parasite's been passed. Or they might need to come back for a okay. follow-up visit so we can continue working on the neurological system, let's say. But as far as having to continuously work on the microbes, um, that seems to be clearing really nicely. That's so cool, okay. So um, what you have here is, uh, you've got the phage, right? And then you got the cell, the top of the cell, this pink body down below, and it's actually injecting its DNA into uh, the bacteria, okay? Is that and that so, white squiggly line that I see going into the red? Yes. And so and if a phage is already inside of that bacteria, uh, once that bacteria dies, it spills open, it breaks open, and then it uh, can go to the, it'll go seek out that next uh, bacteria host, and then it will inject its DNA in there to deal with it, okay? So that, what you're seeing there is that phage injecting its RNA DNA into the host bacteria to start the next lytic process. So cool. Well, good luck to you guys. I'm so happy that you had the time to meet with me and Texas Lyme Alliance and answer uh, patients' questions about this new innovative treatment that y'all have come up with. Tell Dr. Jern again that we all said hello and thank you from well, the bottom of our hearts to try and keep us all out of bed and get the rest of them up and going back in their family life. So we appreciate you guys so much for what you do. Thank you. Happy to do it. You guys stay blessed, okay? Thank you. You too. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.